is JJ McCarthy a first round talent? It's a really interesting question, especially when you contextualize how he played at Michigan and what they asked him to do. It's a really difficult question to answer because of all those factors, but you can't deny that he was 20 and one as a starting quarterback. And he led Michigan to their first national championship since Brian greasy did in 1997. How do we contextualize what he did and what he was asked to do? And how is all that going to project to the national football league? Welcome to skull search. by Tyler Bornis, the managing editor of USA Today's Vikings Wire, writer for the College Football Network, publisher of Substack Run In Shooter, host of The Good, The Bad, and The Hungry on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network, as well as a founding member of Vikings First and Skull. Welcome, everybody. I'm your host, Tyler Fornis. With me, as always, is producer Dave. We're here to talk about J.J. McCarthy, a very, very interesting prospect for a lot of reasons. Main reasons because of where he played and how they asked him to play. And projecting him to the NFL is a very difficult task because you don't have a lot of film on some of the things that you want to be able to have film on. You don't have him really taking over games as a quarterback. You don't have him doing a lot of those similar things that you saw with like a Caleb Williams, a Drake may Uh, he's not throwing the ball all over the field. Like those guys, because under Jim Harbaugh, Michigan wanted to run the football, play great defense and throw when they had to and throw in opportunistic times. So in essence, some of that is very similar to like a Kyle Shanahan offense. He wants to run the ball. He wants to grind it out, but he also understands, Hey, I have to throw it to. And that's kind of where we're at with JJ McCarthy. Uh, And it makes for a very interesting discussion. And I want to start here. (sighs) He was a, he's only a third year junior and he was a five-star recruit out of a suburb of Chicago, Illinois. And he won the job in his true sophomore year. Did not, play he played sporadically as a true freshman but they had an open competition with Caden McNamara who really was an underachiever so what they did was they each started one game uh, the first two weeks of the year uh, easy opponents and then from there that was the final part of their competition so it was almost like an audition McCarthy played significantly better and McCarthy got the job led them to their second straight playoff appearance and a narrow loss to TCU. Then you come into 2023. He's the unquestioned starter. And now, how are you going to build off of that? How are you going to continue that trend? How are you going to make an impact and grow as a player? How are you going to develop? And I thought he did a really good job of that. But it could have been better. But Michigan didn't allow it to be. And that's why I've been saying he either needed to leave Michigan or transfer. He should not have returned to Michigan for another year because he wasn't going to develop anymore because they were going to want to play the same style of football. And look, you can't argue against playing that style of football. It won them a national championship and they beat Alabama, Ohio state, Iowa, and Washington in the last four week, four games of their season. And in there, the last six, they also beat Penn state. And in that Penn State game, they won by nine. It was a rather convincing victory. McCarthy threw the ball 10 times. They didn't have to have him throw the football. And that's where I think some evaluators are like, okay, this guy is not the guy. They only had him throw the ball 10 times. What are they doing? Well, this is why context matters because asking him to throw the ball 10 times versus I only trust him to throw the ball 10 times. It's like a square rectangle theorem. It's just because it's always one thing. Like it just because it's one thing doesn't mean it's always the other. They only asked him to throw it 10 times, not because they didn't believe him, but because they didn't need to. And that context, I think is really important when having the discussion about JJ McCarthy and his potential. So in his career completed 68.1% of his passes only threw the ball 668 times 
46 touchdowns, 11 interceptions, a really nice uh, 4.4 to one touchdown interception ratio, 154 carries for 576 yards and 10 touchdowns. It's worth noting sacks are included in rushing stats. So if he gets a sack for negative 10 yards, it's negative 10 rushing yards. So rushing yards for quarterbacks always need to have that context in place, but essentially he's rushing for almost 300 yards a year as a quarterback in college football. He is a dual threat. He does not want to run, but he's very good at it. So something worth noting. Um, Don't worry, Gary, we're going to get to that question. All he needs to sit because I think we have to talk about what he is right now to really answer that question. I don't think it's as simple as a yes or a no. So let's kind of talk about some of the strengths. I mentioned he's a true dual threat and I make this comparison a lot because it's just a stylistic thing. He's kind of like an Aaron Rodgers runner, but he's better at running than Aaron Rodgers was coming out and what Aaron Rodgers became in the NFL. He doesn't want to run, but he will if you give him the space and he'll just gash you for 20 yards. And I'm going to keep making that comparison with some of these guys because I just think it works. And what's really fun about watching McCarthy is when he's running around or he escapes the pocket in trying to uh, uh, make a play happen. He's looking to throw. He's not like, oh, I need to go tuck the ball and run. That's not his game. He wants to attack down the field. He wants to do all of those things. And it shows up in a big way. And he wants to be able to beat you down the field. I think that's important because you, the easiest way and the most efficient way to get yards and score points is to throw the football. It's proven with analytical data and it's been proven on the field. Look, if you can run the ball, that's awesome. And it's an important part of football. But passing is the most efficient way to get the job done. Um, when he does move, you can tell how good of an athlete he is. He's a very fluid, fluid mover. But most importantly, he doesn't waste motion. He moves with intention. And here's what I mean by that. If you are moving around, and if he bails the pocket, and he has moved, every step he takes is for a purpose. He's trying to escape pressure, and he's trying to find somebody down the field to throw the ball to. He's not just running around to run. It's not like like Caleb Williams, when he scrambles, it's not always moving with that same kind of intention, but it ends up working. He just kind of scrambles to get away from pressure and then eventually looks around and finds somebody down the field. So some of those things really do matter. And I like that he moves with intention and he's always trying to attack down the field. Now, when he's in the pocket, he is really good at maneuvering and finding space. He will climb the pocket. Um, He's really good with active feet. If you ever ever watched Peyton Manning play football, and it almost looks like he's he's doing uh, like an Irish jig with how active his feet are. He is. It's it's quite fascinating to watch, and I I I was always curious about it. And then I remember hearing an interview with him talking. And he said that if my feet are always moving and active, then I can quickly set them no matter what, when a guy comes open, when I'm trying to find something down the field. And I always found that fascinating. And I find that uh, McCarthy does have active feet when he needs to avoid pressure and he stays calm, cool and collected in a clean pocket. So he's not a panicky kind of guy. And because of how he utilizes his feet, he can get ready in a similar but dissimilar way to Peyton Manning uh, at a moment's notice. And he does a really good job of that. And when you talk about when he does throw the ball, um, his throwing motion is very compact. It's solid. He can do multiple arm angles. I think his arm strength is very capable. I wouldn't call it elite. I wouldn't call it poor. I'd say it's around the same as Kirk Cousins. It's good enough. And he can drive the ball to the outside from the far hash but he's not going to drive it with like explosive velocity. He's going to get it there. He's going to get it there safely. And I think that's good enough. Good. Like that's what you want. You want a guy who has at least good enough. And then if you have like next level uh, arm strength, that's when you can do things like a Josh Allen, a Patrick Mahomes, a Justin Herbert, and you can do special things. You don't need to do special things in the NFL to be successful quarterback. It just makes your life easier. 
and improves your variance, your wide range of outcomes when you can do things that are just next level. So McCarthy's ability to do some of these things is really important when we're having this discussion. So let's talk about some of the negatives or, and in this case, it's questions rather than negatives. Um, he likes to stare at targets down the field. He doesn't always look off of his receivers. And I think this is just, this comes with experience. I think he got better at it over the course of time, but he also wasn't asked to throw the ball a lot. And I think this is where we can start having that conversation that Gary mentioned earlier. Does he need to sit a year? Need is a relative term. I don't think he needs to, but I think he probably should because there's just so many little things that he can learn at the next level from the guy in front of him. Like if he were to sit behind Kirk Cousins and you can learn so many things from him that I think, I think it would be beneficial. Ryan, I, I, I didn't compare JJ McCarthy to Peyton Manning. What I was talking about was how Peyton Manning like utilizes that quick feet. And then, and then that theorem, I, tr- I kind of, then use that to talk about uh, Peyton Man or sorry, JJ McCarthy's footwork and how he was able to use his feet, uh, feet to be able to quickly set. He's not Peyton Man, but I found that answer from Peyton Manning to be very fascinating because of how he used his footwork and how he was able to quickly set. And it's a different thing with McCarthy. They're not a one to one with how they use their feet, but I, I found that tidbit to be very interesting when we're having this conversation. Uh, it's yeah, he's not Peyton Manning. Nobody's Peyton Manning. Um, but I, I think you can look at certain elements of what a player does and have a conversation like, okay, what he does in this situation reminds me of X player. I, I will only do that. And I do uh, play style comps. So if somebody plays like Peyton Manning, I'll just say he plays like Peyton Manning. But that doesn't mean it's a conversation of, hey, this is his ceiling. This is this, that, or the other thing. It's just play style. It's just, hey, I get vibes of this. And so, you're only talking his footwork. You're not mm-hmm. talking his cerebral uh, cerebral capabilities that Peyton had. Peyton yeah. was so good at that. But you're talking his footwork and how he's moving around, getting ready, and then suddenly when something pops open, he's, he then plants, throws the ball. And it wasn't even a comp. It was just uh, an interesting element about Peyton Manning's game. And then I tied it in with wh- how I saw his footwork. So yeah, the, I, I don't do full-fledged comps almost ever because it just doesn't like it doesn't comping work. A guy People are Hall, yeah. comping a guy to a hall of famer is completely unfair. I only do play style. Be like, okay, when you watch this guy play, this is the kind of style that you can look at, which is why Malachi Corley, the Western Kentucky wide receiver, same archetype as Debo Samuel, like body size, play style, pretty much identical. If you want a Debo Samuel esque player and you want to use that style of player, you draft Malachi Corley and you put him in those same situations. Like that is a, is a good comparison. That's a good comp that I would use, be, uh, but he's not going to be the same athlete as Mal, as Debo Samuel but he's going to play the same style of football. Let's get back to JJ McCarthy though. Um, Decision-making can be a little spotty. Um, He has a little bit of gunslinger to him where he, he thinks he can make every single throw. He, he can make a lot of throws, but he needs to just play it a little safer on occasion. And he forces the ball a little too often. And Sometimes, look, if you see a guy, oh, I can fit it through this narrow window that's like this big. You don't have to. Just check down the running back, get eight yards, and be comfortable with that. Just that That's okay. There's nothing wrong with taking eight yards. Nothing wrong at all. But you need to... Uh, we'll see about Jordan Travis. Um, I'll write him up. I don't know if we'll do a, a full show on him yet. But there, there's plenty of time to get through a lot of guys. So with McCarthy, he he just needs to get that a little more consistent. Deep accuracy as well is far from consistent. Um, 
one thing I noticed with his deep ball, it tends to die just a little bit. So if he's throwing a 50 yard bomb, it slows down and the receiver a lot of times will have to stop and wait for it. And that can be a problem. Can that be fixed? Yes, it can be fixed in a couple different ways, but he's going to have to work on that. He had the second highest completion percentage over 20 yards in college football, but the 40 plus throws are where that issue really lies. Um, he, I think he's really lethal in that intermediate level, the 10 to 30 yard range. That's where he's going to thrive. That's where the bread and butter is going to be made with McCarthy. And honestly, the 10 to 20 yard range is where the bread and butter is going to be made in the national football league, that intermediate level. And you get a guy on a crossing route, catch 10 yards and then go like you can do a lot of different things with those kind of routes. And it allows your playmakers to be playmakers. It, a lot of times it won't put the ball as much in harm's way by utilizing an intermediate level of the field versus deep. So I like a guy who's really consistent in that level. Um, let's talk about some turnover worthy plays a little high 10 p- turnover worthy plays in uh, 2023, especially when you consider he wasn't throwing the ball a ton, but it was concentrated in two rough games. Um, in Bowling Green against Bowling Green, which was week two, and then against Maryland, which was one of the games without Jim Harbaugh, which is important. He played significantly better with Harbaugh as the head coach on the sidelines than he did with Sharon Moore. He and Harbaugh have a weird bond, and we've kind of seen some of that. Harbaugh even called him the best Michigan quarterback of all time. So Bowling Green, it was almost like he was trying to test out the waters on some things because he was making some uncharacteristic throws. It was almost like he was like in preseason and in practice. Yeah. Well, hey, we'll get there. Narsphias. We'll get there. Just we'll get there. Um, it was almost like he was trying to test ranges. So in practice, you want to just fire everything because then you're going to learn your limits. Then you're going to learn, okay, I can't make that throw against this coverage. They whipped the crap out of Bowling Green, and it felt like that McCarthy was using that game to test some of those limits because of what the throws were. He wasn't making those throws later in the year. And I think that context is a little important. Now, was it wise to do that? Yeah, You can argue that it's not wise to do that in a regular season game. But he did, and that's kind of the vibes I got with it. It was like he was trying things. So I'm not going to hold that one too much against him. The Maryland game, he was bad. He was very bad. And he made way too many mistakes. I had a bet on Michigan that I lost because he made too many mistakes, including red zone turnovers. You you can't throw the you can't throw interceptions in the red zone. So that was really rough. Um and now we can also talk about the context of the why with McCarthy. And these are more questions that and concerns than actual detractions because we just genuinely don't have full answers. McCarthy did have four games under 20 passing attempts. Uh, the game, the 10 passing attempts against Penn State. He also had games of 13, 16, and 17. Not really sure why they were sh- so low. And this, I think some of it's the scheme itself, which we talked about. They want to run the football. They want to do that consistently. And you know what? They're pretty dang good at it. They've been good at it for a long time under Jim Harbaugh. And well, they all- if, if the run game is easy and you're producing... Like I grew up, if you can produce over three yards a run per play, you're going to run the ball because yeah. it's efficient. You just march down, getting first down after first down after first down after first down. And Jim Harbaugh is great at developing offensive and defensive lines. And if they can push, get push, running the ball makes sense. And I can see why. They ran it so much and didn't rely on his arm because they didn't have to. It was just easier just to run the ball. Yeah, and I think that's key. It's also college football, which is a completely different game than the National Football League. In college football, yeah, you do that and you have no problem with it. You you run the football because it's so much easier. And I think that's important. You try to win football games first and foremost in college. Second, 
you will absolutely try to develop these guys into NFL players. But these guys are like college football is it's, it's a brutal world when it comes to coaching. If you're an assistant, you could work 10 colleges in 10 years. Like it's just the nature of the business. So like these kind of things are important and it's about winning football games and they won a lot with JJ McCarthy. So that's worth noting. And the scheme, look, they liked, they like to run the football and play defense, but the offensive line was nowhere near as good as it was the previous year. They felt like they didn't trust them. They were inconsistent. And then they lost the, arguably their best offensive lineman, Zach Zinner against Ohio state. So it's, it's a tough one. It, we, I just don't know enough to really have an answer, which is why I have it under the concerns and why my concerns are more in depth, I guess, and more widespread than like the positives, because there's just questions I just can't answer right now. And if I can't answer it, that's a problem. I have to be able to find that answer before I make the decision. And that's where we're talking. We should start talking about kind of the range of outcomes with JJ McCarthy with where he could be drafted. I'm just going to be real. It wouldn't shock me anywhere. JJ McCarthy gets drafted from top 10 to second round. I don't think there is an outcome that would shock me because he could absolutely dominate this pre-draft process and make himself the 11th overall pick. He could have an average pre-draft process and you still see all the tools and stuff. And he's taken back into the first round, round two. I don't think he slips out of round two because I think there's a lot to work with and there's a lot of untapped potential. And when you draft a quarterback, you want a quarterback with a lot of potential. That's JJ McCarthy. Um, I think plus his age figures into that just turning 21. Yep. You still have developmental time on his age, both yes. mind wise and physically that you can work with. And that that's where that makes that sort of appealing. If that's the route the Vikings go. Absolutely. There's, there's layers to this. And when you have these conversations, it, it's a big, it's all part of the picture. And like, I think overall, like let's, let's talk about my grade on McCarthy. I gave him a second round grade. Now with quarterbacks, there's a tax and quarterbacks go earlier more often than not than what they're graded at. So he got a mid second round grade. I'm more than comfortable taking him in round one. I don't know if I'm comfortable taking him at 11, at least right now. And we're recording this January 25th. So if he dominates the pre-draft process and he shows me a lot more, and he shows me some growth. I think I'd feel more comfortable taking him at 11 right now. No, I'm good. I don't think 11 is good enough. I don't think it, I think it's too high, but there is a lot of potential talent. I think this kind of scheme he would thrive in. And I think Kevin O'Connell could do a really good job of extracting the most out of him. Ultimately, here's where I think he ends up. I think he's going to go in the twenties. And I think you have to do a Teddy Bridgewater or Jordan Love trade to go up and get him. You go up from round two. Maybe you have to give up a second next year to make it happen. And you know what? If you have to do that, you have to do that. That's okay. Well, even if he gets close to falling in the second round, that's where if you're the Vikings and you think he could become your quarterback of the future, you trade up in the first round to get that fifth year option, just like they did with Teddy. And you go from there. Yeah. At, at the end of the day, if this is the guy, look, hypothetically, let's look, let's look three years down the line. If you trade up to go get your quarterback and that guy is a borderline all pro and he's a pro bowler, it does not matter what you paid for him. It doesn't. If the Niners hit on Trey Lance, not one person is going to talk about the cost. Trey Lance didn't work out. So the cost seems exorbitant. It does not matter what the cost is. If the quarterback is that good, if the chargers gave up three first round picks to go move up and get Justin Herbert, it'd be a steal. 
because look at Justin Herbert. So whatever the cost is, it really doesn't matter because you got the guy. And with McCarthy, I think he could be the guy. I don't know if he will be. There are concerns that you need to answer. There are different issues that need to be worked out. There are variables that need to be solved and you need to be comfortable. Uh, so, okay. So here's the thing about breakout age, Dan. Um, breakout age is when you have that first great year, essentially like layman's terms. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but if it, like, it's not, if you get to the NFL after age 22 breakout age, if you break out as a true freshman, your breakout age is like 18 ish, like 18 and a half, maybe 19. Like that's a low breakout age. Some guys, it takes them two years to get into the lineup. It's less common now than it used to be because now guys can just transfer. Oh, you promised me playing time. Well, I'm not getting it. I'll go to this school and they're going to give it to me. And then they blossom. So breakout age, I would love to see an updated article to that because I think with the changing landscape, that breakout age element is going to change as well because of the transfer portal and how things are changing in the world of college football. So I McCarthy, in my opinion, broke out as a 19 year old and then he had a better season as a 20 year old. And now you're going to get him as a 21 year old for his entire first year, unless you make the Super Bowl. I think that's, that's pretty, pretty good. And I, I think it was Ryan that said, I'm not trading any draft capital outside of the top three quarterbacks. If it's the guy, it, like if, if Ryan, if you don't think he's the guy, I, I understand that. If you don't think any of the guys outside of the top three are worth it, that's a very fair opinion. I'll say this. If, if the team views it that way and it works, it's an arguable. Like did uh, Dave, do you know what the Ravens gave up to go get Lamar Jackson? I do not off the top of my head. They traded up from, I think it was 55 gave up a fourth. And then the next year's second round pick to go get up to 32. Okay. That's pretty good. Yeah. Like I, I, I think it trade. They got, yeah. It's great. Yeah. I believe in JJ McCarthy. Um, oh, let me pull up my class rankings because I have not watched Caleb Williams yet. So I expect Caleb Williams to rank higher than JJ McCarthy. I believe JJ McCarthy won him as my quarterback four, and the only Jordan Travis maybe, but I I was never high in Jordan Travis um, before he broke his ankle, and for me I don't give grades on medicals until I actually am told what the medicals are because there's just so many variables, especially with Michael Penix, his shoulder and knees might be completely fine for the NFL, we don't know, nobody knows, and except for doctors. And once, once we hear what the doctors have to say, and that's why the combine is so important. And we may get answers on that at the senior bowl because they do physicals and teams have conversations. So the medical instances I take out of this context, because I don't know. And if I don't know, I can't factor it into my grades, but I always put notes in there. I think McCarthy's going to end up being a first round pick. I think he's going to do really well in the pre-draft process. He's got a really seemingly really infectious personality. And I mean that in a good way. Like he's just like a happy guy. He seems to take care of himself. Like he does the meditation thing before the games, which feels a little weird, but self-care is important. So I, I kind of view that as a positive thing and it works because they won a national title with him doing some of those, I guess, quote unquote, weird is how some people would frame it. Like, I think, I think McCarthy can be that guy. We'll see if I end up uh, agreeing with Peter who says that if Daniels is there at 11, I would take McCarthy. I'm not there yet, but I'm not saying I won't get there. So we'll see how things develop throughout the course of this process. There is a lot to like about McCarthy. Everything. If you look at it, nothing graded below a second round grade. A lot of eight flats there. Um, that was that was not intentional by me. That's just how, how I saw everything. And one thing I don't grade, I, as you can see there, I have functional mobility. I don't think it's a necessity that a quarterback can run the football. I don't like there are plenty of quarterbacks who can't run the football who are great, but 
you have to have an element of Tom functional Brady. mobility. Mm-hmm. Tom Brady, Ben Roethlisberger, Dan Marino. Those guys were statues in the pocket. But what they did have is incredible presence to be able to slide and avoid pressure in the pocket. And they were incredibly mobile for that reason. So I think McCarthy and like with functional mobility, that's why I I view it like that. Like I gave Jaden Daniels bonus points on my scouting report because he was an elite runner. You don't need it, but it's great to have. Um, let, Let's talk about this comment from M. Sullivan before we go, Dave. Um, What games did I watch? I'll answer that, and then we're going to go to M. Sullivan's comment. I watched a lot live, but in depth. I watched Bowling Green, Minnesota, UNLV, and Ohio State. Um, I I did watch Penn State live. Um, so it, he, only, he only threw the ball 10 times, so I didn't feel like I really needed the all-22 of that game. But I've watched a lot of J.J. McCarthy throughout the last two years. But... M. Sullivan writes, if you're willing to take McCarthy at 35, then why not at 11? I think that's a really interesting question. And I think you can kind of talk about Will Levis in this situation. If you believe in the guy, but you're not 100% convinced in the guy, that means you're willing to wait. And you're willing to kind of see what happens after you pick and you get the guy that you feel really confident about at 11. So let's, let's go hypothetically. The Vikings love Jared verse. They take him at 11, but they like JJ McCarthy, but they're not hundred percent sold. He's unquestionably the guy, but they believe, you know what? I think he could be the guy. Then you feel more comfortable making that bet in round two than at 11, because if you take him at 11 and you're wrong, you're out of a job. If you take him at 42, and you're wrong, you're going to get a lot more grace from uh, the front office and ownership by getting that bet wrong than getting it wrong at 11. So I think that context is important when having that conversation, M. Sullivan, because if you, you have to be fully convinced to be able to make this guy the franchise quarterback. And... Ryan doesn't uh, buy the hype, thinks McCarthy's a developmental QB. I think it's partially developmental, and I think he's he's at a point where he can do a lot for you now, but you still have to work on a lot to get him fully a fully fledged franchise quarterback. There's it, he's not flawless, and that's why I think a, a sitting a year would do him a lot of good, or sitting a significant amount of time would do him a lot of good. So it's going to be a really interesting one here. And McCarthy is going to be a fun one to track throughout the off season. Let, let me answer a few questions. Dave, a few more, cause they're, they're coming in and then we're going to get out of here. Uh, Dave Fredrickson. Uh, how do we know that Michigan trusted him, but chose not to throw when they needed to trust him. It was blatant that they actually did with how, with the route concepts they ran and how he threw the football. They trusted him to throw over the middle consistently, and they trusted him in fourth down situations. They trusted him on third and longs. They were throwing, they were running concepts down the field where he would have to hit them rather than trusting yards after catch concepts. And if you don't believe in your quarterback, and it's it's third and 10, you throw a crosser for five yards and ask that receiver to go get the rest of it. They were asked, they, they were trusting him to throw the ball down the field it just wasn't their style of play. So that's how I view it. And it may not be the consensus way throughout like the entire draft media, but that's how I see it. Um, Chris says, if we're comparing Levis and McCarthy, he's taking Levis. I disagree. I have McCarthy ranked higher. The thing with Levis is he has Josh Allen type tools, but he was so inconsistent on how he used them. And how he handles the pocket. And it was too scary. And I don't know if he'll ever be able to consistently be able to utilize those tools. And I still don't. I don't think we have nearly enough information after his rookie year in Tennessee. We'll see. But I thought he needed time to sit just like McCarthy. But the difference was McCarthy just turned 21. When Levis, Levis is already 24. 
to me, that's a big difference. Um, Mateo says McCarthy is a more athletic Teddy Bridgewater. A little bit. I do think he has a better arm than Teddy as far as arm strength. So, but I, I, I understand where you're going with that. And I, I can see it. Um, Dan says, if you take JJ at 11 and you're wrong, uh, it happens if you trade up to two or three and wrong, you're fired. I think if you take him at 11 and you're wrong, you're fired. Um, it just makes it a lot quicker if it's at two or three and you make that move up. So if you take him in round two, you, it'd be a lot easier to keep your job, especially if the team is still winning because it's a lesser asset. Um, I, I, uh, last question is going to be from RJ, uh, the Don, do you think there's a huge gap between him and Bo Nix? If you look at my grades, yes, I think there is a big gap between him and Bo Nix. I think Nix is a more polished player, but there's a lot less upside. And I think where he's at right now is actually less than McCarthy. Um, I think if you're only going to run a massive quick game offense where it's almost like flag football, you three step drop and throw to this spot every time. I think Nix can be okay, which is why I made the comparison about uh, that having him in a Kyle Shanahan offense, because all Brock Purdy's really has to do is point and throw, be a robot. I think he'd be okay. But I think there's a lot of untapped potential with McCarthy for all the reasons we've already talked about. And I think that's fascinating. All right. This will be the last one. KFT says the only drawback with JJ is he lacks the quantity of throws because of the system he plays in. Yeah, that's very true. But I will say he has a lot of quality throws. NFL throws in an NFL style passing system to, that will translate to the NFL. And I think that part is important too. With that, that is our show. I've yes, got a David. question. Go ahead. With Jim Harbaugh taking the job at San Diego, yep, i.e. the LA Chargers, would he be looking to bring J.J.? No. I really don't think so. It, it, that contract is pretty much untradeable, and Justin Herbert's already a top five quarterback in the NFL. You don't trade that. At, it, Herbert's like 27. I know. You I, I just, before. hey, it was, it was just one of those wonderful thoughts of, hey, maybe Herbert can come to the Minnesota. I do <laughs> think if he took the Atlanta job, yeah, yeah, he's probably taking McCarthy. But the interesting thing about Harbaugh's system, it's not quarterback dependent, and he doesn't. He, it it almost doesn't matter. And I no. think he dropped a lot of that from his time playing quarterback because he was at best an above average quarterback. At like, he was average most of the time, and I think that matters and that context is important. But yeah, I don't really see. I don't really see him going to uh, the Chargers, but no, that is our show. All of us is big round bellies, and uh, that shows at Michigan. It showed when he was in San Francisco, uh, and I think the Chargers will build up their big round bellies, and that'll help Herbert. But it was mm-hmm. just a thought, you know, one of those wonderful. Ooh, that would be nice, but uh, unlikely because we're the Vikings. Yeah. We know how that goes. Yes, sir. That is our show. Next week, we may or may not have an episode of The Real Forno Show, but we will have content airing Monday and Wednesday. Uh, and there may be more. Everything's just in a massive flux because of my trip to the Senior Bowl next week where I will be covering it. Uh, there will be some shorts, so you'll want to like, comment, subscribe, do all those things. And by ringing the bell... Anytime I have anything coming from Mobile, Alabama, you will get it immediately. But it's really important that you do that. And it's going to be up-to-date stuff because I will be live at practice. Um, We may do live shows. We may not. All of that is in flux just because of I don't know how much time I'm going to be able to have to be able to get stuff live. But you will guarantee get stuff on Monday and Wednesday. Don't forget, Saturday afternoon, two old bloggers, 4.05 p.m. Central Time. You will not want to miss it. And don't forget, if you're listening on the podcast feed, subscribe to YouTube or vice versa. We have uh, unique stuff on both. So just recorded recorded the NFC North roundup show. Who will be king? Right before this show. Hopefully it's uh, not the Lions. 
Uh-huh. Hopefully it's not the Lions. Well, we talked and I was asked, Dave, are you still supporting the Lions? And I said, eh, it's 50-50. Because I don't want the Lions to win a Super Bowl before we do. And the Bears uh, broadcaster laughed. And even the Lions guys understood. So it yeah, they is get it. What it is. We're gonna have we're gonna have fun this weekend as we watch the championship games. And everybody that's in the chats, you know, let's talk about it because it's gonna be a blast. And then on Saturday to a bloggers, I I know one of the three topics, and that's gonna be the position reviews, and we're looking at tight ends. And we may actually need one in this draft. And we'll mm-hmm. get to that when we get to skull searching some more eventually. But let's get through some of these quarterbacks first. Yep. With that, I'm Tyler. He's Dave. Skull Vikings. Skull Vikings. Like. Subscribe. And ring the bell to get notifications. It helps us grow this community. And we all love our Minnesota Vikings. And on behalf of Tyler Fornis and myself, Dave Stefano, thank you so dearly for watching The Real Forno Show. Skull, everyone!